my nose is running. And welcome again to yet another episode of the Dank House. <clears throat> As usual, I am uh, your dictator of dialogue, director of conversation, all around weird guy that likes talking about Guinness. And I have uh, an awesome guest. I mean, I, I think Kyle put it like really well in the background. I'm going to throw you under the bus, Kyle. It's you're one of our heavy hitters on the show. We love having you on, Doctor. Uh, we, we love chatting about everything they have they have going on there, and we, we appreciate it. Of course, you know we'll probably let Tess take a little bit of the lead this evening, as she is uh, probably the closest in your uh, realm of of world of exploration. So it helps a little bit there to be able to keep that conversation as high level as possible. But don't be afraid to come back next week. So I just wanted to just start off by saying before i kind of let 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 Tess kind of take the leads and, and run with it a little bit is how have you been how's everything going i mean i think last time we spoke it was just before um the new book from jeff lowensfell came out um and i think there, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with you so uh how have you been and, and for those that haven't um maybe tuned in or caught up with you before um who exactly are you? What exactly is your uh, area of expertise in this wacky world of microbiology? Oh, is the audio coming through all right? Can you hear me? Oh, no. Oh, no. Did, you, did you hear me there, Dr. White? Nope. Nothing coming through. London, I don't think you can hear. J Dr. Uh, White, can you hear anybody? No. James? James? Uh -oh. Yes. I there we go. You. He can, he he can, can hear, hear me. me. Can hear me. Just now, I can hear you, yeah. Can you hear, can me? You hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Tess. So he so can only, he can hear, only the hear the echo. echo. Oh. Mm. He there can we only go. hear the echo. <laughs> huh. Weird. Uh -oh. So we were just saying, can you hear me now? So this is, is selective hearing, through, right? I guess. Selective hearing, yeah. There you go, Ted. You do the intro because apparently he can't hear me at all. So go ahead, Echo. Okay. Okay. First of First all, all I'm I going to you. Oh, you're you're muted. muted. I'm muted. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you, Tess. I can hear, I can you, hear too. you too. Am, Am I, I like doubling or echoing to you? Only when his microphone is off. So I'm helping you out a little okay. bit in the background there. Perfect. Perfect. I All right. So thank you. Thank you. So we found, we found what's going on here. So what London was saying is, you know, we've had you on the show before. It's really cool to have you here. Um, I mean, last time my mind was just like, Phew. So I'm excited for a secondary brain explosion tonight. Um, but, you know, the first question is really like, you know, what are you up to now? How are things going? Um, and then I'm going to have a couple of uh, sort of micro questions and then we'll open it up to the rest of the team just to kind of give you the rundown. So what are you up to? How are you doing? Uh, I w one of the big, well, number of projects, but one of the big projects uh, has to has to do actually with this nitrogen fixing corn and i i might have mentioned this last time i don't remember but uh uh i'm working with a a breeder uh walter goldstein in wisconsin and he's trying to breed uh some nitrogen fixing corn from some of these land races right and uh so we're we're helping him to uh explain how this nitrogen fixing corn works and so putting a lot of energy into into that. Uh, the other thing that we're working on is uh, you know, really something very interesting, and that is the effect that microbes have 
uh, intracellular microbes, endophytic microbes, the one that go inside plant cells, right, and inside plant tissues, but uh, uh, the effect that they have on the DNA of the plant, they, uh, they actually, these bacteria will go into the nuclear envelope and uh, uh, they will, in producing uh, substances like uh, ethylene, which is a hormone, and nitrogen, uh, that affects the DNA of the plant causes the plant to do something called uh, in endo reduplication, which is basically the DNA of the plant becomes polyploid. And so you get these polyploids, wherever these bacteria are, you get development of polyploids and larger cells, cells grow. Uh, so a lot of these microbe rich uh, plants have a really big uh, epidermal cells and uh, where the bacteria are located all over the epidermis, for example, the leaf epidermis and the and other parts of the plant, um, trichomes and all kinds of structures get really big because of this uh, DNA duplication caused by the endophytes. It's really interesting. So that's what we're. So, so I, I knew you were gonna blow my mind, but well done already in the first couple minutes. I think that's super fascinating. I have like so many questions um, to just like follow up on. But before I go there, I, I just was hoping maybe you could kind of recap for folks who haven't heard you kind of explain what rhizophagy is. I mean, that's the title of the talk, but like, and kind of the relationships that you study between bacteria and plants and just give like a little brief summary of that just to kind of fill in listeners who maybe weren't here for part one. Yeah, so... Uh, rhizophagy, or what we call the rhizophagy cycle, because it's actually a cyclic process, is a process where plants will attract microbes to their roots using exudates, and uh, those are sugars and organic acids and, and uh, sometimes other compounds uh, go in with those exudates, and that, that attracts bacteria to the root tip, and then the plant at the root tips will absorb those bacteria into the root cells. And then once inside the, the root cell, the plant will use reactive oxygen, superoxide, really, uh, uh, in order to, to and it, uh, superoxide is very, very potent. And it's like an, it's a potent oxidant. It will remove the cell walls off of the bacteria, and turn them into naked protoplasts. And then the plant will uh, manage these microbes in the cells, uh, extracting nutrients from them. And if they're nitrogen fixers, it will it will get nitrogen from them. And I say that because we could see the nitrogen coming out of these bacteria around the bacteria inside the cells at the actually the root hair tips. But the bacteria, uh, once nutrients are largely extracted, uh, the bacteria will uh, be ejected from the hairs from the tips of the root hairs. Uh, every time the root hairs grow, it'll shoot some of the bacteria back out to the soil and and just over and over and over again uh, until there's no bacteria left in those hairs. Then those bacteria, once they're ejected out of the root hairs, they'll reform their cell walls, they'll reform their flagella, they'll swim back out into the soil, acquire more nutrients later to be attracted back to the to the root tips of, of uh, some growing plant. And uh, that's how these endophytes microbes actually get into plants as plants absorb them. And uh, then some of those, they'll move throughout the tissue, throughout the, up into the stems and to the leaves and they'll function and even into the, into the seeds and so forth. So plants will maintain these communities of microbes inside them. Uh, and I think, Tess, I think that was it. I think that, uh, did I answer the question or did I miss something? No, that's a really good summary. I just think it's so fascinating that that relationship uh, in the side chat, I was just like, the plant to go out, retrieve nutrients, come back. And this relationship has had to be going on for so long. It's like amazing to think about 
uh, those microbial plant interactions. And uh, like, again, and my background is in microbiology. And I know London said at the very beginning, uh, you know, my being a microbiologist, we have the most in common, but microbiology is so big and you can study so many things. You can get a degree in microbiology, a PhD, and never hear about rhizophagy. So it's like really cool that um, you are kind of pioneering this area. And I think Anna might has next question here. I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay, I don't think James can hear me. No. Okay, hold on just a sec. Let me turn off my Bluetooth. Really loud. Try being can you hear really me loud. No. Nope. Okay, right, then I can't. What's your question? question. We'll get to respond. We'll get test that. Do you want to like uh, test? You got a hardcore question, and then Anna can type it in. Yeah. Well, unless Anna wants to just say it now, and then I can repeat it, so we can get twice. <laughs> we can't. Anna, you could say it. You could say it and uh, let Tess repeat yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, be, let me be your interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> She's thinking about it. So, in the meantime, while Anna is um, sending me her question, can you, can you hear? I'll say something, Tess and Anna. Uh, because you mentioned uh, before that probably plants have these, has been doing this forever. You know, uh, we do have at Rutgers, we have some students now working on uh, early land plants, early evolving plants and uh, bryophytes, right? The mosses and the liverworts, the, like the first plants that came on earth. And they're finding these same associations in these very primitive early plants. So uh, what you said, uh, probably the first plants were doing this, that's absolutely correct. We're finding that those direct descends, descendants of those first plants, the ones that are most like those fossil plants that were first moved on from water to land, they have these kind of associations in them. They have microbial endophytes in them and they're juicing them for nutrients too. It's not the same as the rhizophagy cycle because those first plants, those early plants had no roots, okay? But the but they take microbes into their tissues and they uh, get nitrogen out of those microbes and probably other nutrients as well. So, and not only that, we're finding that even in, in algae, they have bacterial endophytes. So, and of course, algae were the ancestors of the land plants. And so if they do it, and the early fossil plants do it, probably all plants on the planet Earth do it, have done it, and are doing it now. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a unique thing. It's early on, you know, the plants have been internalizing microbes. And, and I'll tell you something else that's interesting. Fungi, like mushrooms, do the same thing. Fungi actually absorb bacteria into their hyphae. And uh, we can see where they cluster these bacteria in, the, in some swollen hyphae and uh, where nitrogen accumulates around those bacteria. So we have this kind of a endophytic symbiosis that occurs in fungi and it occurs in all groups of fungi. You know, all from all, the, all of the land fungi do this the mycota, so-called mycota, the true fungi, right? All the mushrooms and the ascomycetes and all the disease organisms, you know, they all have these endophytic microbes. Yeah, so there you go. That is so cool. And it's, it's not a big surprise though, when you think about like other relationships that we see like humans and their gut microbiome, for example, like sending out serotonin into our bloodstream and like, you know, which is a neurotransmitter. It's literally communicating with our brains. Um, so it doesn't, it, it's like cool to think about. And then you think about like lichens, which are kind of taking it one step further, right? They've got these photosynthetic partners and a fungi partnering up to be a completely new species, which is just like, shoom, shoom, like mind blown again. But I think, um, were we going to try to get Anna to ask a question here? 
Yeah, Anna, if you can hear me, ask your question and then Tess will reverb it over. Okay, so can you hear me, Tess? Yeah, I, I, I can hear you. Okay, okay, so, so really, 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 really echoey to me. Okay, so um, I was just interested when you first started the conversation. I had to dip out, so I didn't j hear what you just said. But um, you mentioned at the beginning that you were looking into some of these microbes that actually enter the cell and the, the nuclear envelope and then start messing with the DNA. And I'm super interested in polyploidy. And I'm guessing when this happens, it's a localized polyploidy. So it's not like the whole plant is a polyploid. And that's really what like a lot of people have been focusing on is creating polyploids and having triploid and 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 tetraploid polyploids, not just for, uh, you know, kind of squashing um, unwanted pollination and outdoor growth, but also to try and um, see if we can't make the plants have higher yields, more cannabinoids, terpenes. It doesn't seem to work like that. But if there's localized polyploidy and is that, are you able to control that to where you can actually like make bigger trichomes and not affect other parts of the plant? Or I want to hear more about that. That's what I'm super interested in. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. There's an echo. Did you hear that? Okay. I, I don't hear an echo now. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, you can control it. And it is it is localized, but it is controllable. And I've, I've been putting some thought into that lately because, you know, it's a pretty important from a number of our uh, projects we're involved in. For one thing, the corn, you know, breeding corn. And uh, I mean, if this if if we're if we're correct and uh, all the data suggests from what we can tell that this is what's happening, that the microbes are causing uh, by because they're producing ethylene uh, the, and and nitrogen, they're they're causing uh, this thing called this phenomenon called endo duplication or endo reduplication. Basically, what it is is uh, the DNA divides without the cell dividing or without even nuclear division, at least not at first. At first, there's no nuclear division. So you get, like you said, and polyploids, develop, natural polyploids, and they develop locally in different parts of the plant. We can actually uh, speed up the process by, uh, and, and I guess this will, this, you know, we don't, I, I try to avoid patenting things. So if I say it on in the public, it's impossible to patent it. Okay. But you could use it. Right. So here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the deal. Uh, you can control it. And the way you can control it is you can get the bacteria inside the endophytes to produce more ethylene. And you do that by uh, providing them with the amino acid arginine. And what, what the bacteria do with arginine is they will use their, they will, they will absorb the arginine and then they will use their uh, enzyme uh, called microbial uh, ethyl, ethylene uh, synthase. They will use that enzyme to uh, uh, to actually turn arginine into ethylene. And when the microbes produce that ethylene, that will cause this endoreduplication or polyploidalization in, in the cells that have bacteria in them and that are exposed to uh, the arginine. And then what you'll see there, you have to be real careful because you got to put it very, very low concentrations because if you put it high, you make so much ethylene that the plant will get really stressed out and the plants will turn white. Uh, the cells, though, in those tissues uh, uh, get really big. And that's because the cell growth, the ethylene is a plant hormone, but the cell growth is at least in part, the result of having much more DNA in those cells. So you get the cells, all the cells that are impacted will be really, really big. 
and I say cells with bacteria are the ones where you'll where you'll have the effect, right? But uh, in plants that are microbial rich, you see bacteria that go into the ovaries, into the into the ovules, uh, into the inside the seed around the embryo. Once the seed develops, you, we even see uh, these bacteria uh, going through pollen in the in the corn. In the some of these bacteria, these endophytes, go through the pollen itself, and we can see them inside the pollen. Uh, so, I mean, they're basically uh, basically all over those reproductive cells. So, if you could put just a tiny bit of arginine, you may be able to naturally trigger that. Uh, polyploidization in the in the ovaries of the of of uh, hemp or whatever plant you're working with. You have to try it though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah I'd love to try it. And uh, you know, you're just down the road from us. I'd love for you know us to still set up some experiments if you guys ever have the chance it seems like you're pretty busy out there yeah i'm i'm pretty busy but uh i mean we could collaborate on something and uh you know arginine is pretty easy to come by and uh you know uh, you know if you wanted to i mean i'm not sure how to administer it you know i could i could envision giving your plants a little take a little uh hypodermic needle and stick it and give them a little shot but actually more like maybe putting little drops on daily or something like that on the on the fruit to see if you could get poly or or the pollen if that's what you're trying to do see if you can get polypoidization there sounds like it's like enhanced breeding with microbes like that makes sense especially if those relationships are super important for survival and like um yeah a lot of other micro things that microbes do but kind of transitioning i think mark has a question next and i'm excited to hear the chemist's point of view all right am i echoing can you hear me james you can okay uh, very nice to meet you um i have a soft spot in my heart for Rutgers. Well, I grew up in New Jersey, and so everybody who uh, lives in New Jersey gets recruited by Rutgers at some point. Uh, but I actually, I have a friend on the faculty there who's been there for many, many years, and she loves the, the department. Um, so my question, it's not, well, it's not so much a question, more so, um, well, I guess it is a question because I don't know what, it, what the answer is. Um, has to do, uh, I guess, with the f phenomena that you were referring to before about nitrogen fixation. So, you know, as a chemist, you know, nitrogen is a horribly inert molecule. It's not very reactive. It's it's very happy just the way it is, N2, right? It doesn't like reacting. But microbes have figured out, <clears throat> because they needed to make amino acids and proteins and they needed to figure out how to make soluble nitrogen right i mean so that's the key is nitrogen fixate in fact i think what your work reminds me of which is you know just going back to fundamentals of botany and 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 understanding how fungi work is you know the way that uh the soil biochemistry that's happening assists in a plant in a symbiotic sort of way in that microbes and fungi microbes just in general assist in basically solubilizing this nitrogen that's floating around in the atmosphere i think it's 79 percent of the atmosphere so it's it's pretty abundant but it's pretty darn unreactive in fact chemists like me will sometimes use nitrogen uh to inert an atmosphere when they uh, fill bags of potato chips they blow nitrogen in there to keep the oils from spoiling uh because it retards uh, oxidation so so i i guess my question is around that fundamental chemistry that microbes and nature has seemed to figure out right um how how do they do it i mean 
I, I could share with you an anecdote where I was um, working uh, in a previous life for a large chemical company uh, looking at wood preservatives. And so we were looking at, we, we investigated in a great uh, matter of detail, the microbial and fungal degradation of wood, right? So to make pressure treated lumber for like jungle gyms and picnic tables and whatnot, chemicals that go in there have to basically make the wood resistant to guess what folks? I mean, if uh, there was no wood decay fungi, we'd be uh, stacked high with all the previous wood from generations past right so it's a good thing that you know microbes have developed a way to consume wood which is basically lignin and cellulose which is yummy yummy bug food right so in in investigating this james and i'll get to my point here we found that certain metal complexes were toxic to the fungi because um and to the insects too because insects also forage on wood and and it was really interesting there was a very interesting relationship between as you say the microbes and the fungi and what we had found initially it surprised us that the initial infestation so we would put chemical treatments into into stakes bring them down to the swamps of florida and louisiana put them into the ground and then go back every six months and pull the stakes up and look to see, you know, have they succumbed to termites and rot and whatnot. That's a, a an adventure like you would not believe because going down south into the swamp, pulling stakes out of the ground, is just a, a crazy assignment. But anyway, to make a long story short, what we found is that certain metal complexes that messed with an area called fenton chemistry. So fenton chemistry has to deal with, with iron in an oxidation way that microbes and um, fungi use to degrade cellulose. And I think what they do, James, I, I don't have any evidence, but I think they don't generate superoxide. I think they actually generate hydroxyl radical. And hydroxyl radical is extremely, you know, Unperm just depolymerizes everything it comes in contact with. It's amazing that they could actually make biologically hydroxyl radical, but I guess that's how helper T cells also annihilate certain viruses in the blood. But um, anyway, so to get back to my question, my question is, is that, um, so we, what we found is that, is that, that, that nitrogen fixation mechanism or the enzyme that the bugs have evolved to do it is a metal centered enzyme and that if you put other metals into the equilibrium by putting them into the wood in this case we were treating with different metal complexes and whatnot we found that things like molybdates and tungstates which if you're familiar with the molybdenum and tungsten, they can undergo an expanded octet, which enables them to do all kinds of oxidation chemistry. But it basically enables this, this Fenton chemistry, which enables the depolymerization of cellulose. And, and it's basically bacteria that does that prior to fungi getting into the wood. And it basically rings the dinner bell for the fungus that comes in after. So, so my, my question is, is that how do they do that? How, how exactly does that work? How do they take nitrogen and make soluble amines out of it? So they're reducing it. So they must be adding electrons into that, into that. But that, that's like middle of the sun chemistry, man. You need transition metals and dry boxes for that, man. Like, how does nature do that? in the roots of plants that's just beyond me oh it's really cool mark it, that's super cool uh, i will i'm gonna let me say something real quick before i answer actually go to your to your question but the um i don't know if you've heard heard of this before um uh, it's nice you brought it up but when wood is degrading 
there is a there's a kind of a paradox. Wood is wood is fairly low in nitrogen, but as it's degrading by fungi, it increases in nitrogen. And the reason for that, at least our answer to that, is that uh, fungi, these wood decay fungi, like all fungi, they have their endophytic microbes, and uh, those microbes are fixing nitrogen, and we can see that nitrogen in there. Okay, but and different different fungi will do it a little bit differently, but they'll but they'll maintain those endophytes. And and now to kind of get it that what you were talking about, you know, we we have an understanding of how nitrogen fixation happens, and uh, it's a basically an enzymatic process. With NIF genes and uh, those, there are certain cofactors involved. Molybdenum is one of those cofactors. It's in, important in there but there's other there's other uh, other metals are important too and they kind of surround okay so that so that uh, is kind of our main understanding of how nitrogen fixation happens and it, it's kind of a it's basically all enzymatic and it's an energy driven takes so many ATPs you got to have a lot of sugar to do it so it's a big energy driven process but there is another alternative well, and, well, it's an interesting. interesting I, wanted, I wanted to share with you with them that you you'd mentioned is we found an interesting effect on the termites is that termites store molybdenum because there's so little in the environment they have a natural storage mechanism, a protein that they can't turn off. Well, when they hit our steaks that were made out of molybdenum, it turned the termites blue. <laughs> the termites that were dead around it were basically blue. So we say that they died of blue ass. I'm sorry. I had to share that. <laughs> okay. Well, that's really interesting, Mark. Uh, there is a... a where was I at now? Where was I at now? Oh, there's another option, <laughs> option for nitrogen fixation. There is a process that we don't really understand, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's non-enzymatic, non-energy driven, driven process, uh, and it has to do with silica. Silica. It's known that silica can actually catalyze without non-enzymatically the separation of water into oxygen and hydrogen and it so happens that some of the cells like the trichomes and epidermal cells where we think we're getting a lot of nitrogen fixation where we, we can see it using our our histochemical stains uh, that that they contain silica and there's silica in there uh, and uh, uh, it it so it's possible that there is this other process for uh, non-enzymatic nitrogen fixation that might happen in in uh, uh, inside plants. We don't know for sure, but the same process has been hypothesized for uh, re-carbon fixation, carbon dioxide fixation. So basically, taking those hydrogens off of out of water, get doing something with the water, with the oxygen. We don't know, and then taking those hydrogens and sticking them on uh, nitrogen in some cases or carbon in other cases. And, you know, those, those are, those are, that's an area that's, we don't know anything about it and there's very little work on it. Mostly they've been do, studying nanoparticles and what's happening on nanoparticles, that silica, nano silica particles and stuff like that. But uh, um, it's a really interesting alternative. You know, we just don't really understand a whole lot about how nature works, how plants work, how microbes work. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot that we, we really only have the tip of the iceberg, which you know, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, well, I, 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 think, I, think, I think you were talking before about um, uh, the way that these things sort of underpinned this communication system it reminded me of some recent work that i was reading about quorum sensing which is the chemical communication between bacteria right so it's kind of like a, a I, I guess in the insect world it would be chemical ecology right 
So pheromones and, and certain, you know, chemical language in between species that sort of creates this music that maybe we don't fully understand just yet. And, and, and that's, again, what I was thinking about just with something as simple as wood decay, how um, such of an orchestrated thing has to happen, but it's been happening for so long on planet Earth that they've figured this out. And even though we try to intervene with chemicals, they have to be super toxic in order to preserve wood for a real long time. <laughs> anyway, really, that, that that we have all this capability in organisms. You know what is we should have known already that that what what we see in the rhizophagy cycle, uh, we should have predicted that it it was that that it existed based on what we know. For for example, with the uh, the endosymbiosis hypothesis, right? I mean, this is basically what, what we're talking about, that endosymbiosis hypothesis where Lynn Margulis uh, came up with, a, and actually it was, it's an old idea, it goes back uh, to Germany years before, but the idea that cells, eukaryotic cells, are made up of collections of of prokaryotic cells that fuse together, right? You have your mitochondria, you have your, your, your the big cell, the outer cell, the eukaryotic uh, mother cell uh, that, that actually is from an archaean, a, a kind of prokaryote, a simple prokaryote, non-nuclear. And then you have mitochondria and chloroplasts that came in to make plants. Mitochondria alone, you know, you turned into animals. And, and uh, so you have plants with, with, uh, uh, algal absorbed blue green alga being absorbed and so you have these units that make eukaryotes that are that that kind of suggest that you had to have this kind of endosymbiotic uh rhizophagy type events that happened and what we didn't know is that it happens all the time that it's continually happening that uh yeah it's it's fascinating and that's how that's one way that organisms uh, capitalize on things as they combine and mix and 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 tackle things as communities it's re it's really interesting it's a little you know a little i mean it's just so fascinating how capable mother nature is and the way that she does what she does and and capitalizes on substrates it's it's, a, it's, a it's mother nature is genius really when you think about it, any any meiosis. Yeah, I, I I totally, totally agree with you. I think that you bring up like about twenty different points that I want to follow up on. But one is really this notion. You know, a lot of times we hear survival of the fittest and like leave the weak behind. But like really, those organisms that evolve and survive are those that, and this has been shown scientifically too, those that learn how to cooperate and really leverage uh, different species strengths. And I think that we can definitely learn from that. Um, and really, um, not only as humans, but also in a lot of the things that we do, like, you know, not exploit, but really utilize uh, some of these different strengths of different organisms. And I think that kind of speaks to the next question, which is coming from Damon. So sending this over your way. Okay. Okay, we're not echoing. Perfect. <clears throat> Hello, Professor, Dr. White. It's nice to see you again. Um, my question I don't think is, you can hear you. oh, you can't hear me. Okay, Tess, ask away. <laughs> oh, darn. Well, luckily, Damon typed this in. So, you know, he's thinking a lot more about how you can utilize the strengths of microbes um, uh, in a very practical way. So we were earlier, we were talking about maybe going in with a syringe and like dripping onto the plant. But um, how how could we really utilize both the indigenous and introduced endophytes? Um, what's the best growth medium? Could you put them in the soil or is that something that you're gonna to wanna to topically apply? And do we even really completely understand it in a way that um, we can utilize right now or is there still more work that needs to be done? No, I think you could use it right now. Uh, you could, you, I mean, uh, you could get commercial biostimulant microbes and use those. 
uh, you can uh, take plants that are uh, that have microbes, well, that are superior performing plants and take that microbiome out of the superior plant just by grinding it up and then germinating your seeds uh, that you want to put the microbe in, the donor seedling, right? Germinate them in that liquid. And uh, the microbes, they readily pass from plant to plant. Now there's sometimes compatibility issues. You know, they may, they may be stimulatory in one plant, adapted to the plant. You know, everything works when they're in one plant. Then you put in another plant and you get a slight repression in growth. That repression might have to outbreed by, uh, by producing seed for a couple of generations to get it back up and superior performing. But you can move those microbes over. You just may need to breed afterward to stabilize that. That's the, that's the role for the breeder. You know, microbiologists are, I mean, we can move these microbes around, but it, they have to then be stabilized and adjusted. And that's, that's the job for the breeder. So you're not only breeding plants and, you know, you know, hunting and stuff for plants, but also the microbes that come along with them. I think that's really cool. And to kind of go along with that, I think Johnny's got a question next. Yeah, so you just kind of, hey, Dr. White, can you hear me or no? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so you kind of just brought up something that I've been thinking about um, as far as transferring endophytes from one plant to another. Um, my question is, like, how long will endophytes um, reside in a plant that is, you know, is no longer living? Will they survive the process? Will they move out of the plant? Um, and then with that, uh, well, I guess if you answer that, I can see if my next question is appropriate. Okay. Yeah. The, you know, uh, some of the endophytes are going to be trapped inside that plant. They don't grow. Some of these bacteria don't grow very well. And, uh, they're really trapped in a, the cell walls because they're underneath the cell walls, some of them. And uh, they, uh, some of them can get out. They can burn their way out. Others may not be able to get out. Um, I mean, we you, you see this phenomenon often when you're trying to isolate endophytes from plants. And then if you take a whole plant and put it on, uh, on a on a plant to make them come out on a growth medium, right, with sugar in it and stuff to make them grow, they won't come out. In some cases, uh, but if you take the plant triturate it up, grind it up into little bitty pieces, and then put it on the medium, you kind of break that symbiosis, right? You take them out of the cell wall, and then they'll, then they'll grow. Other endophytes can come right out, you know, and usually there's a, an endophytic community in there, including fungi, and uh, the, the fungi oftentimes can go out and go into the soil, and some of the bacteria also, if their soil capable if they, if they can if they're not too dependent on the plant they can go out into the soil the plant gets these microbes from somewhere and the only place really is from the soil you know and that's the reason for having healthy soils taking care of the soil awesome, awesome. so that, that, that kind of oh i'm echoing okay um so with that, you know, some being trapped, some not, you say if you, you know, essentially pulverize material that they'll have easier access to get out and do their thing. Um, so I'm guessing that using a, like a crop residue um, or leaving behind crop residue will have that same effect, letting a plant maybe um, cold compost or something like that, or just act as like a, a mulch or something like that. A lot of those endophytes have the opportunity to to kind of get back into the soil and to other plants. Um, so th there's a, a technique that's used in a lot of ag organic agriculture practices. It's essentially um, putrefying or liquefying um, plant, plant material. Um, you know, it could be from the crop that you're growing or other crops. Uh, do you think that endophytes have a chance to, to survive in that like a liquid culture like breaking down in water over time do you think there there are some that will be able to make the transition into that state um and then be you know incorporated in the, into the soil that way yes um you know there's some systems where uh like the 
the, the Johnson Sioux bioreactor, for example, where you process plant material, all kinds of refuse material, uh, and then you, you essentially ferment it for a long period of time. And then you age it to a certain point where, where you actually what happens is a lot of the microbes will die in that system. If you were to put that uh, green full of microbial mix in this ferment, you know, with a lot of microbes there, if you were to put that on your plant, you would repress growth because there's too many microbes, too many different species. Some of them are going to be oxidatively resistant. And so when they go into the plant, the plant growth slows down. Uh, so you actually slow growth. But what people do is they, they will age the ferment to a certain point till it actually when they look at it, you can it begins to clarify. And what happens at that point is that the, a lot of the active microbes that are in there uh, will die. And, and uh, the certain species that can form endospores will form endospores. And then the and then that uh, mix becomes rich in a few species of resistant bacteria. When those then are applied to the plant, to to crop plants, uh, it doesn't inhibit. It stim tends to be stimulatory to growth. So it's a matter of of uh, fermenting uh, to that plant material to the right stage of of development, you know, and then and then applying. Well. I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show and you answering these questions. And um, I like how you just touched upon that you're working on nitrogen fixing corn. Um, and we just move on. It's, it's so cool and like pretty revolutionary stuff. So um, it's really awesome to hear. And I hope you come on the show again because I have about a thousand more questions that I'd love to ask you. Okay. Okay. I'm happy to come on. Uh, yeah, that nitrogen fixing corn is really cool, but I but I do want to say that it's you know for corn that's pretty spectacular, but m most plants have microbes in their cells where they're fixing nitrogen somewhere and they need those microbes for proper development. Without those microbes the plants won't develop properly. So, I mean, this is almost I don't know of any plant that doesn't and uh, typically they have specialized cells where they especially grow the microbes and get nitrogen out of them uh, and mostly hairs hairs but also epidermal cells and trichomes leaf hairs and places like that uh, but uh, all of them all plants have bacteria endophytic bacteria in there and sometimes yeasts and sometimes algae, they'll absorb algae in some cases. So uh, they all will take microbes, bacteria mostly, but still into their tissues. And it's just like, a, it's a requisite, it's a prerequisite for proper development. They just won't develop properly without them. And uh, so, I mean, when it becomes, I, I don't think we yet have a full appreciation of how filled with microbes plants are and fungi are and we know they're in our guts but they're probably other places in our cells and in our tissues that we don't know we're not quite you know it's hard to put a human under a microscope and look at them and see the microbes there but they're you know you have eukaryotic groups fungi have them plants have them likely animals have them too in our cells somewhere in some places I love it. It's so true. And that's like, it, it really, again, speaks to that communal, like life forms working together can really uh, make survival, especially when you're talking about like surviving fermentation, you know, microbes have to do that. And then they also have to survive getting their cell walls stripped off during rhizophagy. And then they go back out and like, they're just really hardy little buggers. But next up is Kyle. And I think he's got another nerd question for you. Dr. White, can you hear me? Nope, nope. Okay, so sounds like I'm going to be doing this one via the chat, um, and I'll have someone else ask. No worries. Um, or I can just go ahead and ask it, and then Tess, if you want to go ahead and repeat. So 
Uh, I know we've done like some work to kind of isolate the endophytic communities that that there one are sec. in. One sec, Dr. White. Kyle's going to ask this question, then I'm going to translate. So we've kind of looked into some of the endophytic communities within cannabis and kind of you know seen what's culturable and but I think to my knowledge at least we don't really understand what all of these endophytic communities are doing and what exact roles they play. So. Um, is there like an ideal, uh, it's kind of like, I guess I would relate it to like a human microbiome. We don't really know. We know that there's probiotics. We know we can feed our microbiome. Do we know if there is an ideal microbiome? So I guess the same, I guess I would ask that same question. Do we have an ideal endophytic community for cannabis and what does that look like if so? And, um, as we've kind of teased apart and played it out some of these things, or some of them maybe even being uncultureable, what, uh, what roles do some of these endophytes play within cannabis? All right. So this is our last question. So we're going to try to make it kind of quick so we can wrap up right at the hour. So in in like one to two minutes, Dr. White, Kyle had a very elaborate question and it's really, really cool, but I'm going to simplify it a little bit. Sorry, Kyle. He's So he was talking about endophytes. You know, they're really difficult to culture. We're still learning about all their roles. Um, but, you know, what um, could you define like an ideal endophytic microbiome and what would that consist of and look like in just a couple of minutes? Well, no, I can't. <laughs> you, you know, we don't understand how the microbiome works yet. We're trying to figure that out. And what are the parts, you know, people are guessing, you know, we're doing a lot of, we figure, we, we guess that we need to have you know, microbes in there that do different things. And so in agriculture, we figured out, well, they need, plants need phosphorus, they need nitrogen, they, they uh, need to be protected from disease, uh, maybe stressed, protected from stress. So let's, let's grab a microbe that does each of those and let's put it on, right? Purely, we made that all up. I mean, it is true they need phosphorus and they need nitrogen and stuff like that. But, you know, are these the best microbes? Is this what plant would do? Probably not. You know, we we did that. Uh, but we rationalized it. Right. But how do we do we know what what works best in a in a microbiome? No, we don't. We don't. It's probably not a certain number of microbes i mean i i would i would throw in you know i mean the consortium of what we said about nutrients but when you when you when you consider what about development how the plants develop that's important to a plant right so having microbes in there that stimulate development having some microbes that'll make nutrients and bring nutrients you know so all all of that but what does it involve how many microbes it's a community that's really all i can say it's a community of microbes and it's hard to it's honestly hard to remove those microbes to make a pure plant there is no such thing as a sterile plant there's always something even when we sterilize the heck out of the plant we can't remove all the microbes there's still microbes in there and I would just ask that's the best the, I can do, Kyle. And and I would just add also for um, those who are curious about learning more about Dr. White's work, he did and you know what makes it like sterile plants like they don't exist, and there's a good reason why. You can also see evidence of this right when he, he's, he does some stuff with, I believe it's tomato seedlings in this video on YouTube that I watched prior to, to the show. So anyway, highly recommend um, watching that because it just shows how stunted the root growth is if you don't have these microbes present and you treat them with antibiotics. So um, yeah, just to throw that out there as well. So Kyle was just uh, basically saying how awesome your work was and that there was a YouTube video recently that you showed tomato seedlings and stunted growth without type, you know, having microbes. And that really um, speaks to the value of these endophytic microbes. So um so yeah, I think that's really, really cool. And sorry, there's been a couple audio issues tonight, but I haven't, I haven't minded being the dictator of dialogue tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, I think it's about time to wrap it up. So the question that we always ask at the very end is, you know, what are you doing right now? Where can we find you and how can we support you? And so, yeah, just 
give us a little wrap up and and tell us like you know what we can do to read uh what you're writing or watch your videos or support you well i i i could i'm at rutgers university right i just got a couple of two new graduate students so they join a group of about 10 so and uh all working on end of fights different aspects of end of fights uh and uh, uh we just had it we just did a an article in the journal uh called grass research on uh uh in part on well into fight into fight symbiosis the evolution and agricultural impacts so we just did a little review about that it's open access you'll find it uh you'll find it in that journal grass research and it talks about the how uh, the early plants and so forth how all plants have them and how we can detract from uh from the the way that the endophytes work in plants and how we can damage the those symbiosis by how we treat plants how we treat the seed and how we treat the soil and so forth so that's a little bit of that is in that article but uh that's that's what we're all the all the stuff i talked about we're working on trying to trying to do is and i have a graduate student uh, april michi who's got a study down with dr anibus uh and uh uh on working on uh, uh hemp uh glandular trichomes and uh students working on all kinds of other stuff so that that's that's it i'm happy to be here to talk to you guys i'm glad you're interested we're always, we're always really interested. interested oh and i meant it so much it echoed so we're always super interested in having you on um every time we have you my mind is blown and as i said in the beginning i was like i don't know how brains can explode more but they did so thank you so much and um I is I don't know if London is echoey if he wants to close out or thumbs up. Does that mean I go? Because <laughs> yeah, come back next. Everybody, come back next week. Party every every week here on the Dank Hour. Thumbs up. Woo! And the credits. Mm -hmm.